Hello, and welcome back to Old Testament. Today we will talk about the book of Joshua and the concept or the topic of holy war. Uh, you may have thought that there are only other traditions, uh, not Judaism and Christianity, that have holy war as a part of them. But uh, all we have to do is look at the Bible to see that there actually are traditions about holy war. Uh, and there are many legacies of holy war uh, in both Jewish and Christian traditions um, to show us that people have been reading these texts and thinking about violence uh, and violence that maybe uh, at least appears to be directed by God in these texts um, for many millennia. So what do we do with these texts? Well, our big questions today and there, of course, there are many different ways to read the book of Joshua, to try to understand it, to interpret it, and so on. Just for the purposes of our class, I'm going to have two guiding questions uh, for our material today. The first guiding question uh, is, how does the book of Joshua describe Israel's entrance into the promised land? It's a conquest, right? They just, they come in and they, they kill people and they leave, right? Uh, or they actually stay, right? And set up a, a new country. Um, actually, that's not the way that it's described in Joshua. Many people have a problem with Joshua's uh, description of the violence uh, and the, the um, essentially the genocide that happens uh, with the Canaanite people who live there. But at the same time, a lot of us don't actually read these texts very closely. If we read them closely, we'll find that it's a lot more complicated than we might have imagined. But the second guiding question for the day is how do we understand violent language about God in the Old Testament and I would say also in the New Testament as well? Uh, how do we understand violent language about God? Uh, I'm not going to tell you exactly what to do about this language. I'm going to give us some options, some interpretive uh, possibilities. And uh, then we're going to ask you this week in the forums uh, to, to think a little bit further about that. Um, how do you understand uh, these violent images and violent language, um, violent metaphors about God's uh, presence and activity um, in the biblical text, but also how do we understand those today? So just to bring us back up to speed, we're talking about uh, this transition from Deuteronomy to the book of Joshua, this transition from uh, the Pentateuch or the, the Torah or the books of the law, the books of Moses, right? The first five books of the Bible, we're, we're transitioning from there into what we would call the Deuteronomistic history. There's a lot of debates about whether the, the sources that we've been talking about so far, J and E, P and D, whether they continue into the book of Joshua. Some people think this is the way it happened, but uh, some people also, other biblical scholars say that uh, there's, an, there's an absolute line really with uh, the end of Deuteronomy. What we see after that point is uh, this work of the Deuteronomistic historians, which are using ancient sources, but uh, in a very particular way. Um, so in any event, we're, we're moving into the promised land. Here, this is an image of the plains of Moab, uh, in an actual place right uh, across the Jordan River uh, near the Dead Sea. That's the Dead Sea you can see there in the Jordan River Valley. And uh, on the other side would be what's described in, uh, the, in the Old Testament as the promised land. So my argument about what 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 happens in uh, the book of Joshua, especially uh, chapters 1 through 11, uh, my argument, and you can follow along with me and see if you think I'm right or not, um, but th this is an idealized entry into the land. Idealized. Uh, there's, it's an, got an ideal quality to it. Um, another way to talk about this is that it's been sacralized or lit liturgized. Uh, it's been made into a liturgy. Uh, that it looks nothing like a historical event that might have occurred um, that has to do with conquest. This, this just doesn't look anything like a battle or battles that anyone would have encountered in the ancient world. And what's more, uh, I think that this is taking part in um, an ancient way of speaking about conflict and an ancient way of speaking about not just the God of Israel, but God's more generally in the ancient world. So. My argument is that the book of Joshua participates in some very common rhetoric, or rhetoric as a way of speaking, right? Some very common rhetoric of the ancient world, or we also might talk about genres, right? A, a kind of literature. It participates in these genres of literature that we can see embodied in the Meshastella that talk about holy war, uh, that there are other holy war traditions out there that Israel participates fully in the, the sort of cultural matrix of the ancient Near East, right? Ancient Israel comes out of many different ancient Near Eastern peoples. There's Egyptian people who become part of Israel. There's Syrian people who become part of Israel. Uh, there's Mesopotamian people like Abraham and Sarah. Uh, there's people from all over the ancient Near East that end up becoming a part of Israel. Uh, and from that, we can say that 
God speaks to ancient Israel. God is speaking in a language and a culture that makes sense to these people. It's an ancient Near Eastern way of thinking and talking. So God has adopted some of these ancient or Eastern ways of speaking and speaks through them. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're all good. God, I think, uh, uses the cultural, linguistic, theological ideas that are available um, with their uh, warts and all, right? Uh, there are problems with some of these ancient or Eastern cultural ideas, and I think we can point that out pretty easily with Joshua. But, but before we just throw this book away, let's take a hard look at it and try to see what we can understand culturally uh, about the ancient Near East and about Joshua's role in it before we um, try to interpret it um, so that then we can try to figure out what it is that we're interpreting and what to do with it. Um, Okay, so uh, uh, my, my claim here, my thesis, is that we are looking at an idealized story. Um, it's a bit, sounds a bit like make-believe. Uh, it's an idealized story uh, about this ideal tribal organization uh, where you have all these tribes and so on. Um, and it's trying to show in a way how Israel is going to live in the land. Um, we can see this even in chapter one, right? Moses dies, and then uh, you know Joshua basically rises up uh, to take to take Moses's place. Um, uh, but we see that uh, well, they're about to cross into the land, and Joshua is telling them basically, "Here's what you have to do: you have to be strong and courageous." Verse seven, um, and then make sure you 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 keep talking about this law, this Torah. In verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate upon it day and night and so on. And then God will be with you. So really it's about following the Torah. That seems to be the, the point of, of Joshua. Um, it's not great military advice, I don't think. So uh, we'll, get, we'll get, uh, get a bit more into that. But one of the things that, set, that tips me off um, that this is uh, maybe a strange, thing that's happening here um, uh, is uh, the, uh, how strange a character Joshua seems to be. Just think for a moment. Joshua in chapter one takes over from Moses and begins to lead the people and then has this book, right? And is telling people to follow the book. But just think about how Joshua is described in comparison to how Moses was described. It seems pretty clearly that Joshua is modeled on Moses. He tells you to do everything Moses did, and uh, God is with Joshua in the same way that God was with Moses. There's a lot of comparisons. Even just look at chapter 5, um, uh, where uh, near the end of chapter 5, like starting with verse 13 of Joshua, um, how there's this uh, messenger from God um, who looks like a human, human man um, who uh, is standing there and Joshua comes up and says, are you one of the Israelites? Are you, you know, are, are you a Canaanite basically? Should I fight you or not? And uh, uh, God says, I'm and sorry, the, you know, through this um, messenger, the messenger says, uh, I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Uh, and then the person says, uh, or the angel now, says, remove the sandals from your feet in verse 15. Uh, for the place where you stand is holy. Uh, it, it sounds like a very biblical thing to say, and like that would be said all the time. But in fact, there's only one other place where this occurs, where people are told to take off their shoes because they're standing on holy ground. That's Moses in Exodus 3. So it's not common, in fact, to take off your shoes um, in respect of holiness uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, the Leviticus doesn't tell the priests to do that in the temple. They're supposed to wear shoes. Um, so all to say that this is a very clearly, it's, it's modeled on Moses and Joshua is supposed to be Moses. But just think about how different they are. Can, can you think about problems that Moses had, uh, character flaws, you know, weaknesses that Moses had? Oh, they're very clear, right, from the very beginning. Moses is kind of disowned by both his own birth family and the family that he's been adopted into. Moses kills a guy. He's a murderer, right? Moses is somehow um, slow of mouth or heavy of mouth. He can't speak very well, according to Exodus 3. Aaron has to speak for him. Moses uh, commits all kinds of problems, right? I mean, he, he, he does things wrong from time to time. He also does things right from time to time as well. But for some reason or another, Moses is not allowed to come into the Holy Land, right? Moses is not actually even allowed to come into the Promised Land because of something he did that, that, that made God mad. It seems like Moses is actually like a, like a well-rounded character, right? He, he does things wrong. He's reprimanded for it. He grows. He changes. He moves from not speaking to speaking a lot and so on. You know, he's, he's this kind of, a, a, I don't know, interesting dynamic character. Can you name any character flaws that Joshua has? Can you think about anything that Joshua did that God got mad about or that some other 
people might have thought was uh, uh, sort of deeply problematic within his own group. Was there, were there rebellions against Joshua? Where did Joshua come from? How was he born? Who's his family? Even the question, what is Joshua's job title? What is he? What is Moses is another question asked about that. Here, turn with me real quick to Numbers. So turn with me to chapter 27, uh, right after the, so the story of the daughters of Zelophehad uh, in the book of Numbers. So Numbers chapter 27. So the Lord says to Moses, go up on this mountain of the Abiram range and see this land that I've given to the Israelites. And God says, you're not going to get to go in there, right? Because Moses did something wrong. And then God says to Moses, so verse uh, 18, the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit, and lay your hand on him and have him stand before Eliezer, the priest and the congregation and commission him in their sight. Here you see Mark Chagall, the uh, uh, Polish French Jewish uh, uh, artist from the 20th century uh, who has drawn the commission uh, of of Moses uh, uh, on Joshua here. So, but anyway, uh, have him stand before Eliezer the priest and commission him in their sight. Commission him as a what? So you shall give him some of your authority, some, not all of your authority, so that all the congregation of Israelites may obey. But he shall stand before Eliezer the priest we shall inquire from the Urim and the Thummim. They're going to roll the dice. We're going to hear about more about that in a little bit. Uh, and then verse 22. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eliezer the priest and the whole congregation. He laid his hands on him and he commissioned him. As a what? As the Lord had directed Moses. He commissioned him in the way that God had told him to be commissioned. What in the world even is Joshua. What was Moses? He wasn't a king, that's for sure. Uh, he wasn't a priest because he ordained all the priests, but he himself didn't serve as a priest. The priest of the sons of Aaron. He wasn't a, uh, uh, like a Levite either. He was from the family of Levi, but he wasn't a Levite because then he'd be a servant, right, to the priests. Um, he wasn't a judge exactly, but he kind of was the head of all of the judges, right? He picked the judges and gave them rules about how to operate. Gosh, what was Moses and what is Joshua? Well, we don't actually know. It doesn't tell us, right? So all to say that uh, Joshua is a suspicious character to me. He's like Moses, but with all the bad stuff taken out, with no depth and with no backstory. And in fact, he doesn't commission anyone in his place afterwards. Why in the world would there not be another leader after Joshua? Instead, we move into this period of the judges that are raised up charismatically, right? That means like uh, they kind of have the spirit of God show up on them for a certain period of time. Um, but Joshua doesn't commission them. Joshua just dies and then... Israel's in kind of a chaos. This is all very strange, isn't it? Uh, why, why isn't Joshua all over the Old Testament and the New Testament? You know, why wouldn't it be that people would talk about this guy who didn't do anything wrong and, and who continued Moses' career and so on? Moses is spoken about all the time, but, but Joshua just kind of fades away. So there's something about Joshua that is both tantalizing and also is troubling. Uh, and that same kind of troubling feeling follows me when I read into the book of Joshua and I, I keep reading and uh, I, I start to ask questions about what happens here. Uh, so, okay, so let's say you're in charge of an army and you want to take over a foreign land. Okay, so you're on the edge, you're on the, you're on the banks of the Jordan River, you're about to go attack, right? And there's an unsuspecting populace of Canaanite people who are waiting there for you. And apparently they're very strong, they're heavily armed and so on. So what you're going to do is you're going to run across that river and you have kind of a, you can do pull a sneak attack, right? They might not be expecting you. So you have the element of surprise, right? So what you want to do is you want to go attack right away. So that's what they do, right? So in Joshua chapter two, they spy out the land and then in chapter, so they got all the information they need. They can craft a good battle plan and just element of surprise, right? So chapter three, they cross the Jordan and they don't actually move quickly at all. In fact, they take a long time and they move slowly across this river. Uh, here's a uh, medieval image of the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They step in the river and the river is cut off. Okay, so they, they move the Ark. The Ark of the Covenant is the central player of, of the story for the next couple of chapters and it's slowly moving across this river and then the river dams up. Now you've heard this before. This, this, this kind of made your ears tingle, right? They were going across a body of water and the, that body of water split so that the people could cross on dry ground, right? Made you think a lot of perhaps the Exodus, chapter 14, right? The crossing of the Reed Sea. 
This is supposed to make us feel like this and think like this, right? This story in Joshua 3 is supposed to make us recall this. It's like, you know, Exodus is kind of leaving the ocean and then, then they go in here. But, but there isn't an enemy army here at all. Can you imagine the Canaanites in this heavily fortified cities watching an army cross over the river and not doing something about it? But also the fact that they, they cross over the dry ground and then, and then they fight, right? No, in fact, they don't... They don't fight. Um, uh, Moses uh, doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, Joshua doesn't say, uh, get ready, right? So, uh, you know, chapter three, verse five, I would expect Joshua to say, sharpen your swords. Instead, he says, sanctify yourselves. Tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And then there's this crossing of the of the, of the river. And, and then <clears throat> once they get across the river, then they got to fight. Now they're on enemy turf, right? And the enemies can see them. I mean, we're talking about a place that's not very big. Palestine is not a large place uh, compared to like, uh, if you're, you know, I grew up in in Colorado, which is just you can get up on a mountain and see forever, and you're still in Colorado, right? It's a huge expanse of land. Um, uh, Israel today, like there are points where it's like you know ten miles across. You know, you can see uh, you know, from major cities um, uh, that were occupied by Canaanites into the Jordan Valley. So everyone can see them. And once they cross over the river, then what do they do? They fight, right? No. In fact, in chapter four, then they pick up stones and they build an altar. And it's kind of like a memory place, right? A, a, a place of memory. Uh, they manipulate stones. Um, uh, so once they're done building this kind of uh, memorial, then, right, then they go fight, right? No. In fact, then they decide to circumcise themselves, and this gets even more confusing because they decide to circumcise themselves a second time. According to chapter five, verse two, at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites a second time. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know how much you know about the practice of circumcision or the biology that lies behind it, but it is not possible to circumcise a second time. Circumcision requires uh, cutting off a flap of excess skin or foreskin that covers over the tip of the male penis. That can happen one time and one time only. Uh, there's not more extra skin that can be taken away without severely damaging uh, people's bodies. So what does that mean they circumcise them a second time? And then it goes on to kind of explain this strange statement just as Joshua made these flint knives and circumcised the Israelites it repeats it but it doesn't say second time the second time it says it which is also strange and then in verse 4 this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them all the males of the people who came out of Egypt all the warriors had died during the journey and then they were circumcised but the other the new generation wasn't circumcised for the Israelites had traveled 40 years and then in verse 7, it was their children that Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. This is the first we're hearing of this. They traveled the whole way. They had manna every single day, and God gave them very specific directions about how to handle manna, but they somehow forgot to, that circumcision was a part of their tradition, but all the parents were circumcised. I don't know about you, but... Uh, it's pretty easy to tell if someone is circumcised or not. I'm sure that the kids ask questions about their dads at some point or another. Um, this, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, so th why, how, how could it be that Moses hadn't told the people, by the way, you should circumcise yourselves because God made a pretty big deal about that in the law. And, and in Genesis 17, to be part of the covenant community, you have to be circumcised. Who wouldn't have been circumcised? Well, people who are newly joining the community. Let's keep this in mind. Just keep this in mind. What we see in all of these actions so far are liturgical actions. There's a procession across the Jordan. There's a, there's a liturgical procession across the Jordan in chapter 3 where priests are in charge. They're moving a holy object. And then after that, they build a religious memorial, another liturgical action. Liturgical meaning part of worship. This is our worship life that we're seeing here enacted on this stage, not a military campaign. After that, we have this second circumcision, which is by itself a religious ritual. And we have the second circumcision, which again doesn't make sense unless there are bunches of new people who are joining the community who have not yet been circumcised before. 
And then after that, of course, they attack, right? Nope. After that, starting with verse 10, they celebrate the Passover next. They're sitting there. The enemies can see them at the beginning of chapter 5. The kings hear about this. They're near them. They see them. And they watch them celebrate the Passover, and they don't do anything about it. Um, this is very strange. This is a long, multifaceted ritual or sacral entry, right? A holy entry. This is a ritual entry into the land, and they haven't fought any at all yet. Then in chapter 6, they begin to fight, and that fight itself doesn't look at all like a war, right? It looks like a ritual. They march around the city a bunch of times, right? They, they are uh, blowing trumpets, they're singing songs, they're marching with the ark. This is a procession. We are watching a liturgical procession. So why in the world would they have this tradition? What does this mean? Well, well, I'll get into the details of this more later, and I'll give you some reasons why it might have been this way. But just to say, what we're looking at is a long liturgy, a very long, in fact, liturgy of entering the land. And I wonder if what we're reading about is actually about a liturgy that Israel lived every year or time and again, that was really a religious procession or series of religious processions that involved welcoming new people into the community, which is why they would have to be circumcised. They would be new people entering the community, not people who had grown up in the community because they would have all been circumcised. And you can't circumcise people a second time. So I wonder if this is a ritual of welcoming in new members to the community. But it's been somehow, it, it remembers this event of coming into a land but it itself might not be a part of that. Uh, it might not his be a historical memory of this. Uh, there's um, a, one other kind of part to this. Turn with me to the, to the end of Joshua, chapter 24. We see another liturgical moment here in the book of Joshua. In chapter 23, Joshua gives a speech, kind of a final speech to the people. Um, but then in chapter 24, Joshua gives another final speech. Uh, this, this time, Joshua gathers all the tribes of Israel at Shechem, a city in the north, and summons the elders, the heads, the judges, and the officers of Israel, and they present themselves before God. And then Joshua begins to tell them a story, a long story. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago, your ancestors, Terah and his sons Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River and served other gods. So we start at the beginning here, the beginning here meaning Abraham and Sarah, right? So I took Abram from beyond the river a long time ago, naming the foreignness, the initial foreignness of Israel. That Israel was comes from Mesopotamian people, right? And then there's this procession of the family. And then I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you to the sea. Uh, and then you cried out to the Lord, verse 7. And then I brought you across, right? And I did miracles right there. And then verse 8, then I brought you to the land of the Amorites, that is the Canaanites, who lived on the other side of the Jordan. They fought with you and I handed it to you and so on. He's telling the story, kind of like we saw in Deuteronomy chapters 1 through 4, the story of how Israel came to be. And then verse 11, when you went over the Jordan, came to Jericho, you fought with them and so on. And then I sent the hornet, some sort of divine being ahead of you, uh, which drove out the kings of the Amorites. And you didn't win this with your sword or your bow. So your fighting didn't do any of this, really. God made the people run away. Then I gave you this land that with the vineyards and so on. Now, therefore, revere the Lord. And serve God in sincerity and faithfulness. This is verse 14. This is really important. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. What? These people have been in the wilderness for 40 years. There's like nothing else there. They left Egypt. They went to Sinai. They threw away all their idols. They made another one, the golden calf. They got they got that out of their system, right? And they got punished for that. And then they went on. They didn't have idols with them. And then they go into the land and conquer it. And now they're hearing that you need to put away all of your foreign idols. So they just had to hear the story of Israel and how Israel comes from foreigners, right? Israel comes from people who aren't from this land. And then they hear that you need to make a choice to serve Yahweh and put away your foreign gods. In verse 15, if you're unwilling to serve Yahweh, choose this day who you will serve, the gods of your ancestors, what they served, or serve the Lord, serve Yahweh. And the people answer, 
far be it from us that we should forsake you and serve other gods, for God brought us out of the house of Israel. The people are kind of, this is a liturgy. Joshua is running the liturgy and saying, telling the story, kind of like reading scripture, and then posing the choice. And the people are saying, this is kind of like a baptism or kind of like a, a, con a confirmation, a, a liturgy. Think about confirmation at your church where you have to kind of agree to the teachings, right? And then you have to make a choice. And you have to say, yes, I, I agree with this, right? Um, so he protected us along, God protected us and so on. And God drove out the peoples out of the way. Therefore, we will serve the, uh, the Lord for He God is our God, right? And then Joshua says, you can't serve Yahweh. Yahweh's holy and jealous, right? And let's make sure you understand this, right? Then people said, verse 21, no, we're going to serve the Lord. And then they said, and then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. They said, we are witnesses. This is a covenant ritual. This is a covenant ceremony. We are witnessing in here a covenant ceremony. And then they even mentioned that in verse 24, the people said to Joshua, the Lord is our God and we will serve and God we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the peoples that day and made the statutes and ordinances for them at Shechem. Joshua wrote these book in the book of the law of God took a large stone and he set it up in the sanctuary. He said, all the people see the stone as a witness and so on. And we see all this ritual stuff that's happening again. Now, what's important about this to me is that we're witnessing a ritual where people are having to be welcomed into the covenant community. Now, these people were already in the covenant community if they were this generation that came from the wilderness. But maybe, just maybe, the bones of the story of Joshua are really telling us an ancient covenant ceremony that welcomes in foreign people into the community of Israel, as we know happened from time to time, like Rahab's family. And then, we, in fact, we hear other stories uh, about people who manage to, like kind of foreign people who get to work their way into um, the community of Israel. Uh, if you take a look at the Gibeonites in chapter 9, they trick their way into the community. Joshua is actually full of these stories of foreign people who work their way into God's uh, community and the people of Israel and then have to kind of join this covenant community. Those are the people who had to get circumcised. Those are the people who had to swear, we will serve Yahweh. Or they had a choice. They could go, they could go away, they could leave, and they could go to a different place, right? Um, so this, what, what we're seeing are covenant ceremonies enacted and reenacted liturgically that have been kind of mapped over this event of historical conquest. So that's why when I read the story of Jericho, I say what we're reading is really a liturgy. And that liturgy does go awry at points. So this sacral war or ritual war tradition, it's really what we might call a holy war tradition. And uh, we can read a little bit about uh, this holy war tradition and think a little bit about how um, it was a historical tradition outside of Israel. This is a common way of people in the region, in the ancient Near East, uh, especially um, we know in Canaan. This is a way that people spoke about war uh, and about their gods. And it was also a part of propaganda, political propaganda. So this is what we uh, talk about in uh, uh, Hidden Riches. Chris Hayes uh, uh, gives a little background to the Mesha inscription or the Mesha stela. Stela is just a stone, big, big monumental stone, public stone that everyone could see uh, back then. And uh, so this is a Moabite stone. It's also sometimes called the Moabite stone. Uh, it's, it's the only existing uh, text from Moab. It's in Moabite, which if you know Hebrew, you can read Moabite. It's got like, couple little differences between Moabite and Hebrew. It's basically like saying British English and American English. It's actually even closer than that probably. But um, all to say, this is this is written about the year 840 with by King Mesha of Moab. And he tells us that. So on page 193, I am Mesha, son of Chemosh, king of Moab, the Dibonite. My father ruled over Moab 30 years and I ruled after my father and I built this high place for Chemosh in the citadel. So this, this uh, if rock that we're reading um, would have been in this citadel, right? Um, in this uh, high place for Chemosh. So it would have been in a sanctuary, in a citadel, that is a fortress, uh, uh, a high place, you know, like this, this is a, 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 a place of importance, right? A, 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 so this is a public place where people can read about this public event uh, that happened. And then on the next page of 194, at the very top, Omri was king of Israel. We'll read about Omri in a couple weeks. Uh, Omri uh, was a, a great king of the northern kingdom who gets very little uh, kind of uh, coverage in the Bible because he, he wasn't a good king according to the Deuteronomistic historian because he didn't really worship Yahweh exclusively. But he was very powerful as a king, we know, from other sources like uh, Mesha. So Omri was king of Israel. For many days, he subjugated Moab. So Moab was a vassal of Israel who was a suzerain. 
right? Because Chemosh was angry with his land. So here, King Mesha is saying that his own god, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, was a bit upset with the Moabites for not obeying. And so he was allowing, that is the Chemosh, kind of imaged as this male deity, um, was, uh, uh, was upset, so allowed this foreign people to conquer them for a while. Does that sound a little familiar? It sounds a little bit like the exile. Um, this is what a lot of uh, uh, biblical writers think happened in the exiles, that Yahweh allowed a foreign people, the Babylonians, to come and conquer them as a form of punishment of some way. We're going to get to all that later in, in, in different ways, actually, in the Bible that people imagine the exile. But in any event, Chemosh is angry with the land. And his son replaced him, and he too said, I will subjugate Moab. So Omri's son, Ahab, uh, who's not named here as Ahab, he's just Omri's son. But I will subjugate Moab. In my days, he said that, but I dominated him and his house, and Israel was completely destroyed forever. I'm going to read that again. Israel was completely destroyed forever. I don't know about you, but I can look on a map today and I can uh, find a nation that calls itself Israel, at least. Um, it is not contiguous with ancient Israel uh, in political ways or, or in terms of uh, you know, genetics. And you know, there's, all, there's all kinds of stuff uh, that, to, to say, but there's definitely no kingdom named Moab anymore, right? Um, uh, no, uh, he did not destroy Israel forever. Uh, Israel continued to exist as a people uh, after King, King Mesha. What is that? What does it mean when someone says, I completely destroyed them? You ever uh, watch like a sports highlights and they're like, he completely destroyed him or you watch like a uh, coverage of a debate a political debate or something like he destroyed him uh, but like no i mean the other person's still standing there i mean it's it's rhetoric it's uh, hyperbole is one way to talk about this hyperbole means uh, exaggeration for effect exaggeration that everyone knows is effect, is exaggeration like that person is the greatest well no we know that person is not the greatest but you're just saying that because it's a way to express how great you think they are so in this way Israel was completely destroyed forever, or Israel destroyed all of them, killed all of them. This is an ancient Near Eastern way of talking. Egypt talks this way. Pharaoh says, I killed all of them. In, in fact, the very first ever stone to, like the, very, the most ancient writing ever that we know of to mention Israel is called the Merneptostela. Uh, and it's from right around the year 1200 BCE. And it says Israel is no more. His seed is gone. I've destroyed Israel, Pharaoh Merneptah says. So the very first ever mention of Israel is someone saying, I have killed all of them. They will never exist again. Um, we know that that's not true, right? That's a way of talking. It's a way of kings when they talk. R rulers, leaders talk this way. I destroyed them forever. So that next paragraph talks about how uh, like I s slew all the people. Um, if like the next paragraph on the uh, third line down, but I fought against the city and I seized it and I slew all the people so that the city belonged to Chemosh and Moab. That's again, this idea, this rhetoric of killing all the people is an ancient Near Eastern rhetoric. It's, an, it's a common rhetoric, a way of speaking. Um, it's hyperbole uh, and it's propagandistic. It's part of royal propaganda. When you read, I killed all of them, I destroyed them, their seed is no more. What you're reading is ancient Near Eastern royal propaganda. This is the way kings talk when they brag. So then, next paragraph, Chemosh said to me, go seize Nebo against Israel. So I went at night, fought it from daybreak until midday. I took it, I slew all of them, 7,000 men and boys and women and girls and wombs, that is, unborn children, because I had dedicated it to the ban for Astar Chemosh. That's a god, right? So uh, all to say is like, I killed every single one of them, every, and even the unborn. I, there, no one could live, right? There's no, no one living. And I took the vessels of Yahweh, which shows us that there was a temple there. This is not Jerusalem, by the way. There's some, some city on the border of, an Israelite city on the border of Moab that had a temple with vessels in it. So that is to say Deuteronomy wants to centralize all of worship in Israel, but we know that they didn't centralize all of it. And I dragged them before Chemosh. So taking the vessels from a temple like the menorah, taking it and putting it in your own temple uh, was the way to do it. And usually they would take the cult statue, the statue of the God, and they would brag about that. But here, the, the fact that Mesha doesn't mention a statue of Yahweh means that there probably wasn't a statue. So this is historical evidence for uh, Israel being an iconic. They didn't like images of their God. So. In any event, uh, there, I think there are ancient images of Yahweh, but they weren't um, orthodox or, you know, the religious authorities didn't, didn't tend to like them. 
Uh, so, in any event, there's there's a lot of other stuff that he talks about here, but this this is just to say the, uh, the one other thing that's mentioned here is the band. Like I slew all of them, you know, I killed all of these people, um, I destroyed them all, and so on. Uh, this is uh, this is a way of speaking, uh, and uh, uh, in that paragraph where he says I slew all of them in the wounds and so on, I dedicate it to the ban for Astar Kimosh. I dedicated it to the ban for Astar Kimosh. The ban there is that word harem, right? Which Chris Hayes talks about, also Coogan talks about, uh, and uh, Chapman talk about in their textbook. Uh, so this, uh, the idea of the ban, right, is a common ancient Near Eastern idea. Uh, it's holy war. It's it's a way to talk about holy war. Um, uh, you probably heard um, mention of like a, a, a harem, meaning um, uh, wives uh, or women and concubines uh, who are in some way set aside for a particular ruler uh, uh, in marriage, usually. Uh, the, the, the harem, and it's usually off limits, right? That, that, that word, that historical word, actually is related to this word harem, the ban, uh, things that are set aside in war, uh, kind of the, the symbol of a holy war in the ancient world. Um, uh, this idea it symbolizes something off limits, like you weren't allowed to go to that, to that place in the palace. Um, and uh, if in, in this, the, there are certain things in this war that are dedicated to the god. Um, so this is not just an Israelite thing, uh, all Canaanites, it seems. And uh, we also can find these holy war traditions elsewhere in the ancient world. Um, so all to say that the, uh, when people went to war, the idea was uh, that the kind of if it was a holy war, if the god was telling you to go to war, there was kind of spoils of war that you weren't allowed to take for yourself, like gold, right? Like Achan does. Uh, he takes this all for himself, right? Uh, you're not allowed to do that uh, if it's a if it's a, a harem war, a ban war, a holy war, a sacred war. Um, uh, th so this this I this idea is uh, that it's it's in a way supposed to kind of limit uh, war profiteering. Um, you know, the average people can't can't sack a town and take everything. They're supposed to destroy everything to give it to the gods. So this is royal propaganda that we find. Now uh, we can see these kind of patterns of. Uh, by the way, here's the, you know the ban or harem, which we see in the Bible. We see it in the Mesha Stella. We see it elsewhere in the ancient world. Um, we see this ban enacted, as I said, by Achan, right, or on Achan and his family. That is to say, there's a gruesome uh, uh, punishment uh, for 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 war profiteering, for right? trying to trying to take this stuff and sell it or keep it. Uh, when it's a holy war, it's, it's understood to be stealing from the gods, uh, and it uh, you know brings terrible misfortune. Again, this is not just ancient Israel who thinks this. This is a, a broadly an ancient Near Eastern phenomenon. Um, uh, so. One interesting interplay here is that the ban uh, says that you have to apparently get rid of all, you know, you have to kill everyone, right? And this rhetoric of everyone killing everyone. They don't kill everyone. We, in fact, know uh, that there are times where they say we will kill everyone, like at Jericho and at AI, right? We're going to kill everyone and, and take everything in the town and dedicate it to Yahweh so you can't take any uh, war booty or, you know, uh, you can't steal anything. But we see these exceptions. I mentioned the Gibeonites, also Rahab and her family. Um, these people um, that are Canaanites, that there's kind of like these loopholes, right, for these people to join the community. And again, they join the community. So if we think about this as really like a, a, a ritual covenant ceremony or something like this for, for outsiders to join the community, these exceptions make a whole lot of sense. Um, but they also make sense if when you say you killed everyone in the ancient world, you didn't mean you killed everyone. We, again, have historical evidence that that's not the case. But we do know that ritual war uh, is talked about in ancient Israel a whole lot. So take a look at Deuteronomy 20, these rules for war. Really interesting rules for warfare here. Um, first of all, uh, I, I noticed that in rules for warfare, um, the, uh, the, the priest is mentioned, but not generals or kings. The king is not mentioned. The king clearly is the person who's supposed to take the armies out. That's why the king exists in the ancient world. So that because they have armies, they could force you to do things, right? Like pay taxes. Um, but uh, when you go out to war, Deuteronomy 20 says, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and army larger than, you own, than your own, you shall not be afraid of them for God is with you who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Before you engage in battle, the priest shall come forward and say to the troops, the priests are kind of in charge here of the, of the army. That's not the case in the ancient world, unless we're talking about some sort of liturgy that acts like war, right? So the priest says, Here are Israel today. We are drawing near to battle against your enemies. Don't lose heart or be afraid or panic or be in dread of them, for it's the Lord your God who goes before you and so on. And then the priest asks a bunch of questions. Has anyone built a new house but not dedicated it? Well, 
you should go back to your house because then you might die and you might not enjoy your house, right? Oh, and by the way, verse six says, anyone planted a vineyard but not enjoy the fruit? And it takes years for vineyards to make fruit that can make wine. So, I mean, you probably got to go home and take care of that vineyard, right? And then enjoy the wine for a while. So we're talking years. Why don't you just go home for a few years uh, and not fight? Uh, and then verse seven, has anyone become engaged but not yet been married? I mean, you should go back to your house because like, you know, you don't want to miss that, right? So, uh, so why don't you go ahead and home? And then, uh, and then the official second shall con continue to address the troops saying, is anyone afraid or disheartened? Just go back to your home. So is anyone afraid? Just go, go home. Because we, you know, we don't want you to be scared. Now, anyone who's built a new home, anyone who's about to get married, anyone who uh, has planted a vineyard, or maybe I mean, you could kind of extend that. You know, anyone who's done anything that hasn't like seen the fruits of that yet, and uh, maybe just anyone who's scared in total. Like that's everyone in battle, right? Like you got you got five people who are left behind. You know, who aren't going to agree to this, one of those things. Um, this is a strange way to begin a battle, just like Joshua is a strange way to begin a military campaign. And then you, you're supposed to offer peace to everyone who you fight against, apparently, at first. Verse 10, offer peace. And if you surrender, okay, then all the people shall serve in forced labor. But if they don't, uh, you know, uh, peacefully resign themselves to, uh, to surrender, then you're supposed to besiege it. Uh, and then you're supposed to put all the males to the sword, but you're supposed to take the women and children as booty or like, you know, you, you can own them. This is enslaving people uh, and everything else in the town, uh, all its spoil. You may enjoy the spoil of your enemies. And that's how you're supposed to treat the towns that are far from you. But the nearby ones, you're not supposed to be so bad at, right? Uh, or you're not supposed to, to be so nice to. Uh, you're supposed to annihilate them. Verse 17, don't leave anything that breathes alive to the, the, the uh, for the Canaanites, right? Just absolutely eradicate these people. Verse 18, so they can't teach you to be, you know, they can't tempt you uh, and teach you to be uh, abhorrent, do abhorrent things and, and violate the covenant with God, right? And then verse 19, if you besiege a town for a long time, make sure not to hurt the trees. Don't hurt the trees. Don't ever cut down a tree because you want the trees. The trees are nice. What do the trees ever do to you? Period. Those are the rules for war. That's all the rules for war there. <laughs> I don't know about you, but this does not seem like a com comprehensive list of rules uh, for ancient warfare. And it seems to have some contradictory materials within it, but also it seems to, um, uh, it describes this kind of ritualistic and maybe propagandistic way to talk about one's own warfare. Um, what we can say is that there's these, these narratives in the Pentateuch, uh, in Joshua, and it goes up through really Samuel, but then it kind of ends. Um, there's these depictions of this kind of ritual war. And what seems to happen is oftentimes there's the spirit of Yahweh. In the book of Judges, you'll see this a whole lot. God's spirit will come on Gideon or, you know, someone will be filled with the spirit of Yahweh. There, there'll be this calling together of the tribes, sometimes with like trumpets or songs or um, cutting an ox up and sending it to the different parts of the tribes to get them to come together and fight together. There has to be some kind of way to assemble them. So the assumption here is that there's not a standing army. There's a confederation of tribes that get together to fight every once in a while. Then there's this like ritual preparation. Again, they like get sanctified themselves, <laughs> circumcised themselves. It, you know, uh, They uh, are told by the priest, do not fear, um, which is part of an oracle of salvation that prophets would give. Uh, then they begin, the, the, the other armies begin to fear, right? Uh, but uh, then you hear this uh, war cry, teruah, which means cry, <laughs> cry out loud, like scream. So the war cry is cry, like scream, um, which is an interesting, strange phenomenon. Um, uh, and then Yahweh confuses the enemy. They don't even really go to fight yet. And then Israel conducts the ban, like the kind of mop-up operations. There's really not much fighting that happens in these ancient battles. Think about Gideon. Think about um, the book of Joshua even. Um, what fighting happens, right? There's very little in terms of actual kind of like hand-to-hand -hand combat, which is the way that in all ancient people fought, right? Um, and then after these battles, there's usually, uh, there seems to be, or there, at times, there's this kind of cry, you know, to your tent, so Israel, um, uh, you know, um, Everyone go home, go home to your own, like, so, so that there's not this standing army or a continuous army um, uh, that, that Israel has. So what we see when we read Joshua, and when we read some other texts like uh, Deuteronomy 20, is we see a highly ritualized version of ancient war. You know this from reading Jericho, right? Uh, so there are uh, uh, and out, outside of Joshua, outside of the book of Joshua, we really only see this in some stories in the Pentateuch or in the Torah, and we really only see it in the book of Judges. The harem itself, the ban, is only enacted in Judges 22, which is a civil war, which is an interesting place for this to occur. And then one time in 1 Samuel 15, 
Saul refuses to do this, and or at least do, do it completely, uh, and is judged by God. But then we see that David is never asked to do the ban or the harem and never seems to do it himself, at least not in the same way that it, it occurs in the book of Joshua. Um, so it's actually very confusing and interesting um, uh, that, that outside of the book of Joshua and these couple of occurrences, that the ban, this idea of even the conquest, is not commanded to happen again and again. Joshua isn't lifted up as a hero all over the Old Testament. The conquest itself is not something that um, it, that they have to do again. Even when they come back into the land, it's not figured as the conquest. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah aren't imaged as the new Joshua. Um, what's enacted again and again is the Exodus. The Exodus is the paradigmatic event for the Old Testament and the New. In the book of Ma- the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Jesus is. Um, he goes into Egypt and he comes back out, right, as a baby in the, in the infancy narratives in the Gospel of Matthew. This is supposed to be like the Exodus, right? Uh, in the Gospel of Luke, uh, Jesus is kind of figured in a way kind of like Moses. Uh, he's figured as Moses in Matthew. Um, Jesus isn't figured as Joshua. Jesus doesn't kill all the Romans. Jesus doesn't clear out the land of Palestine. Uh, this they're, they're not commanded to. Paul never tells us, hey, clear out the land of Palestine, just like uh, you heard about in Joshua. And in fact, the rabbis, the early Jewish tradition, doesn't tell you to do this either. Um, they never say, hey, be like Joshua. So all to say that uh, this part of the Bible seems strangely self-contained. Uh, this is, you know, this, this sacral entry stuff um, seems to repeat only liturgically into the future, and it seems to um, distance itself from this idea of the ban of violence at all, but also the person of Joshua, which should be strange to us. So it's a dramatic sacral entry with this harem or this kind of ban idea that's a part of it. Um, th- what do we do with this? Why is this a part of our tradition? Well, I'm going to stop our video here, uh, and I'll move on in the next video. We're going to try to deal with this tradition. We're going to continue to deal with this in the the, um, discussion boards. Um, So this is going to be kind of a topic for us to reflect upon. What do we do with these these traditions? But I'm going to try to work through some possibilities, some possible ways um, of of imagining what to do um, with the book of Joshua uh, and still be a faithful reader of the Bible. Thanks for hanging with me so far. And uh, I look forward to engaging all of your thoughts on this.